There were bathrooms on the floor above, and medical boxes in each of them. Cracked mirrors and shattered toilets leaned at crazy angles. The whole tilt of the building was making me nauseous, even more than I already was from the grisly work before. My pit buck complained as we got close enough to the stink for it to scan the contents of a little plumbing remained functional. The levels of radiation in the water were rivaled and usually exceeded the levels in Philadelphia. I sat, bracing against the wall, and picked the lock of a medical box in the little mare's room. The lock clicked open with ease. I opened it, emptying the box of its meager medical supplies and adding them to the supplies of the medical box in the little box room. Nothing that would help Calamity's wing, but the small healing uh, polchus would close and heal Zenith's wound. The wasteland sometimes gave small favors. I pushed myself up, feeling unsteady on the canted floor, and hurried back to the others. They were gathering in what had now, or had once been, the firehouse kitchen. Velvet Remedy took the <coughs> poultice and applied it, then buried a needle and thread in Calamity's clothing repair kit. A cabinet two buildings back had offered up some old bottle of apple whiskey, half empty. I whimpered inside as the drink went to sterilizing the needle. I could use a sip. I contented myself with a draught from my last canteen. It was nearly empty. I itched in ways I shouldn't itch. The poultice had stopped the bleeding and partially closed the gap, gapping wound in Zenith's neck. Velvet began to sew the wound completely closed. Even with Velvet's expert intentions, the wound was going to remain an ugly scar for the rest of her life. I realized now for the first time that the zebra would be dead if the magical bolt had struck her just an inch differently. Now you wait here and rest, Velvet ordered the zebra mare, and little Pip, you watch her. I'm taking Calamity to find something to use as rags to clean you butchers off. Velvet stuck her nose in the air and trotted out. Calamity scowled but followed, pausing next to me long enough to remind me. No orbs. I watched him walk out after her. Rags? Sat him more like an excuse to talk to Calamity alone. I let out a long sigh. Worst day ever. It wasn't. But ever since we entered Splendid Valley, they have been working very hard at becoming so. Reaching a lunatier rating of badness. Zenith lay still for almost a full minute before getting up and moving about the kitchen. She had to brace herself on sloping counters as she rifled through the cabinets. Well, at least you're good at following doctor's orders, as the rest of us. I chuckled as the zebra started pulling pots out and setting them on the table. One of them slid down the incline. I caught it magically before it hit the floor. Zenith? I asked, as our worry from the day before flooded back. Do you trust me? Without turning from her task, she replied by asking, Trust you about what? It was a dodge, but still, a fair question. Do you trust me as a person? No, she said simply. Should I? I was taken back by the cool, honest answer. Why not? You are impulsive and have difficulty controlling your urges, she said as she opened a refrigerator door and pulled out a hunk of something covered in grotesquely mutated mold. She set it on the table, and I caught it as it tried to slide away, recoiling from the sight of it. You are a very quick thinker, and effectively swift to act, Zenith continued, crouching to check lower drawers. This makes you adaptable, perhaps more than any pony or zebra I've ever known. It allows you to improvise where others would be paralyzed, but it also leads you to rash decisions from hasty decisions and gets you into trouble as often as you get out of it. She finally pulled a knife from one of the drawers. She sat it on the counter 
as I caught it too, she turned and looked at me. Although, those are just my observations. I have not known you very long yet. She looked over me. Why do you ask? I wasn't sure what to feel. I wanted to argue with her, but a large part of me suspected she was right, and cursed her for being so observant. Do you think I'm evil? Zena stopped, looking at me oddly. No, little one. You are not... I mean, you are one of the most caring souls I've ever met, pony or otherwise. Again, the little pony in my head whispered, corrupt kindness, in the voices of the goddess. Do you think I'm cursed then? At her odd expression, I clarified. I've been touched by homage. The zebra turned back to scouring the kitchen, pulling pans out of a lower drawer to get out a spark battery powered hot plate. Of that, I'm quite aware. I felt myself flush nervously. What? What do you mean by that? There are lovers who are quiet, and there are ones who are not, Zina stated. You are not the quiet ones. Oh no, dear sweet Celestia. You are what my tribe calls a whiner. I felt myself blushing hotly. I wanted to throw myself into the Splendid Valley sinkhole out of sheer embarrassment. You mean all those each? I squeaked. Yes, Zinus confirmed. Each. It took me several minutes and an old sack that the zebra had given me before I stopped hyperventilating. Can you breathe now? Zenith asked gently. I nodded. I think so. The mythical pony is right, Zenith said with a soft smile. You are cute when you are that color. I fell faint. My breathing threatened to quicken again. I took a moment and composed myself. As best I could. So, am I cursed? Because I love homage. She paused, then turned away. I waited for her to answer. The answer I received was not what I had been expecting. The zebras have many... may have been wrong about Amber Moon, she admitted. Your ponies may have been right. The wielders of the elements of harmony may have broken whatever hold the stars had over Amber Moon. Luna may have been different. She turned to me. But that does not mean that the touch of the stars was still not upon her. That it did not influence her in more subtle ways. She looked to me. I am open to your beliefs, but I ask that you be open to mine. Perhaps there is truth in both. I frowned. I didn't want there to be any truth in her beliefs. But I had seen things that suggested otherwise. Things that suggested maybe there was some dark and terrible thing up there in the vast emptiness that stretched behind the moon. But Tomage is not evil. She is not twisted. She is no nightmare moon, I insisted. In fact, she saved their lives. She saved yours. Zenith nodded with a small smile. And would you not say it was quite an amazing shot? Absolutely. It was an... What? The weapon from the stars wants to kill, Zina said. It yearns to kill. Okay. Now that was just creepy. I will accept that homage is a good, kind pony, and that she is not cursed. Because you asked me to, Zenith conceded. Even though I do not trust your judgment, I believe you speak truthfully in this. And I suspect you are better experienced at matters of the heart than I am. I smiled, feeling a touch of relief. Thank you, Zenith. The zebra shook her head. But I ask in return that you keep an open mind to things, I believe, and the watchful eye of warning signs. The stars take a greatest delight in giving us the means to destroy ourselves and each other. 
Do you truly think that your relationship has not changed now, that she has taken a life for you? I felt a chill. I had not considered that before. Or, if I had, I had seen the consequences of being entirely beneficial. She had saved my life. How would that not bring us closer? But had I not, that very night, wept in front of her for having killed a Steel Ranger? Regardless of whether Xena's superstitious fears were justified, she had led me to re-examine what had happened in a less self-centered way. I looked up into Zebra's eyes. Thank you. I floated the whole array of pots and pans. Xena had quickly discovered that no surface in the room was flat enough to safely cook on after a mishap with the hot plate. Not far outside, Calamity and Velvet Remedy had started arguing. We could hear from inside the kitchen, but could not make out their words, not that I wanted to. Zenith fretted, worrying that a discussion would attract more hellhounds, but so far, they were keeping their voices low enough. Still, it added an unpleasantness to the air. I distracted myself by returning to an earlier part of the conversation with Zenith. Do you trust me to tell you the truth? Yes, little one. Unless you believe it is in my best interest to lie. Crap. I hated to think that she might be right about that. I would have preferred to be more like homage. But if it came to telling the truth or protecting my friends, I had a track record of choosing the latter. And while I regretted the necess necessity, it was rarer for me to consider the choice. Did this mean that I was playing steel hooves to homage's Applejack? Well, would you trust me with your life? I asked, as Zenith took the knife and started scraping chunks of mold into one of the pots. She finished, then put the knife down. I caught it again. It is not a matter of trust. You saved my life. You are responsible for it. Ugh. More insane zebra logic. All the worse, since it was insane, understandable zebra logic. I have not chosen to release you from that. Frustrated, I asked, Why not? Look where following me has gotten you. You nearly died. I've taken you from one hellhole straight into another. The zebra looked at me, a touch of sadness in her eyes, then turned away. She filled a pot with horribly irradiated water, and began to mix the mold into it, not answering me. I sat and watched. In the very least, maybe I would learn something. One by one, she added more ingredients, none of which looked healthy. I hope this wasn't anything we were intended to consume. Don't talk, she said, although I wasn't talking anymore. Be quiet. Run. Hide. Her voice was low, heavy. Get your food and hide, or a pony will take it from you. Don't talk. When they come for you, relax. Let them do what they do. Don't fight. Don't scream. Don't talk. She looked up at the canting ceiling. When they hurt you, grunt, whimper, don't talk. Always the same. Until they get bored, then hide, heal. Prepare for next time. And she looked at me. Even if they move to kill you, kill them. Then hide the body. Hide it well. Find another place to be. Don't let them suspect you. Be meek. Don't talk. Hide. A cold shiver passed through me. As I started, and I stared at the scared, scarred zebra mare. It was only after a truly exceptional horror that I dared join the fights. I did not wish to see, for them to see that I could fight, but I could no longer bear it. She lowered her head, looking to me with tears in her eyes. Before you, the slavers. Before the slavers, my husband. Before him, my parents. I have never owned myself. I am not comfortable with the idea. I know this role. I can survive it. I shook my mane. I may not be responsible for you, 
as you say. But I'm not a slaver. I don't own you. And for that, you are a better pony than all the others, Zenith admitted. But still, the fact remains that I don't know how to live being responsible for myself. I think, I told her, you'd do fine. The hallway tilted at such a nauseating angle that I was walking on as much of the wall as the floor. I followed close to Calamity, keeping an eye on my eyes forward sparkle for hellhounds. We were hunters again, at Zia's request. Another one on our six, I whispered to him through the light appeared on my compass. Supply room, I think. I see it, Calamity nodded. Reminding me that the bug-eyed, styled visor of his armor had an EFS of its own. Crouching low, the Pegasus moved stealthily forward until he was in position directly in front of the door, his four magical energy rifles pulsing eagerly. I telekinetically pushed open the door, holding it so gravity wouldn't swing it back shut. A skewering dart shot out of the supply room, bouncing harmlessly off the forehead of Calamity's black carapace armor. Humph, he chuckled, raising his haunches and striking at the blood sprite with the stinger of his armor segmented scorpion tail. The impaled creature squeaked as it died. Heh, he said, still chuckling. Ever wish these things could detect threat levels instead of just threats? I almost wasted a lot of ammo on that bug. I smirked. Often. I turned back to our other friends, motioning them forward. Velvet nodded and nudged Zenith, who was crouched and facing the other way, guarding our flank. My EFS tracked a friendly shot of light as pyrolites swooped in and out of rooms, searching for enemies to burn, or rodents to eat. The Balefire Phoenix returned to drop the charred corpse of a small animal at Velvet's hooves. Oh, thank you! She sang lasciously, stroking the bird's plumage with a gentle hoof. Pyrolite hooted happily and stretched her wings out, fluttering off again. It boggled my mind. You know, you're just encouraging her to keep doing that. And why wouldn't I? Velvet said sweetly. My little Pyrolite is a wonderful hunter, just like she should be. Clemity gave a grumpy look in Zenith's direction. At least, I assumed it was a grumpy look. With my friend hidden inside that armor, I really couldn't tell, but his posture struck me as grumpy. I decided I preferred my friend out of the armor. It made him look more mysterious and rather evil, and it put up a barrier between us that I didn't care for. I'd gotten used to it with steel hooves, but not being able to see Calamity's face just felt wrong. She's a bird of prey, after all, Velvet reminded us. Zena's eyes eyed the charred corpse, and shot her, and shook her head, then cantered towards us, moving with surprising ease down the off-kilter hallway. Clemente flexed, flexed his injured wing, and I thought I heard him mummer. So, was I not so long ago? So, Calamity, I piped up, pulling his attention away. I had a question that needs Pegasus expertise. Shoot, little pip, he said, seeming to cheer up. If I want to clear away a large area of clouds, say, the area over Manhattan, say, just as a totally random example, the area above the Megaspell Chamber, which requires sunlight to function, how could I do so without having the Enclave all over me? Calamity nickered. Oh no, what you planning on now, little pip? Just theoretical. Yep, sure it is, he said, clearly not buying a word of it. Zenith moved up to the body of the blood sprite. Perfect, she intoned, opening her satchel. Leaning for forward and down, she tore off its wings and spat them into the satchel. Now I must find the room to complete the brew. Zenith moved ahead, taking the lead again. Do I even want to know to what? From what I've seen go into it, 
I prefer not to. Returning to my question, Calamity informed me. Well, there's only one way to clear an area that big, that fast. And that's with a sonic rain boom. The gears of my head started turning. Of course, the Enclave's response would be swift and deadly, but you might have clear skies for over an hour. He chuckled ruefully. Which, sad to say, requires a Pegasus capable to perform one, of which a Christian Wasteland has exactly zero. The gears ground to a stop. Damn. Sorry, little pip. Show off or not, that's one trick I ain't never been able to do. Very, very few Pegasi can. And the Enclave keeps them real close. When the firehouse had started to topple, the building came to rest against the Mariponi Mining Administration Building. A canted firehouse window hung open about five feet from the opening of a shattered window on the opposite building. Just a hop, a skip, and a jump, I told Calamity with a smile. I remembered wearing Enclave armor from riding Rainbow Dash's memory. It might look fearsomely heavy, but it was amazingly light. There was no reason Calamity couldn't do this easily. Calamity braced himself against the sloping door. Easy for y'all to say. Y'all ain't never had to do something like this without your wings. He looked at me. If I fall, y'all get ready to catch me, right? Just flip him across, Xena suggested from the opposite window, where she and Velvet were waiting. Yeah, Calamity agreed. I like that plan better. I rolled my eyes, then whispered to him. But, which do you think will impress Velvet more? Calamity straightened up, shook off his fears, and galloped and leapt. He made it with five feet to spare. Show off. My turn. I looked down the sloping floor, and across the gap to the opposite window still. It wasn't even with this window, maybe two feet higher. I swallowed. In Calamity's defense, the tilted floor was throwing me too. I galloped forward, tightening myself at the last moment. After I had all the momentum I needed, I sailed across, smacking into Calamity's armored tail. See? He joked. I told you, nothing to it. I snickered and shook my head. The room was an open office space filled with desks and terminals, none of which had survived well. I checked my EFS and found red lights moving around us, possibly on floors below. I motioned the others to be quiet, and once again I levitated Velvet Remedy as we moved. As we passed the last of the desks, I noticed an orange and yellow book lying on an open waste bin. I floated it out, looking over the cover. The Big Book of Boom announced the covers, adding beneath the dynamite guide to handling explosives. Below that was a picture of the author, Red Three Hooves Runner, with a cartoon balloon saying, you better handle her right the first time, cause she won't explode twice. The book was crammed full of notes and papers. I tucked it away to look over later. Underneath it was an audio recording. I downloaded it into my pit buck and slipped my ear bloom into my ear. Surely Calamity wouldn't mind this. Listening to the recording wouldn't remove me from my surroundings. Mining Officer Torchwood to all concerned personnel. First order of business. We will be having a surprise inspection in two days. Everybody needs to be well rested and at the top of their game. Maripony Operations Overmare Sunny Days has authorization and has authorized half day tomorrow so that every pony can get plenty of rest and have their uniforms cleaned and starched. Any pony who uses this time to go to Ponyville and get drunk will not be allowed back into the Maripony facility or any operations building within Old Olney and will be docked one week's pay. Baskets. Make sure you have proper headgear on this time or you'll find yourself no longer employed by Maripony Mining Corporation. Second order of business. Maripony Mining Corporation has increased demand for productivity. This means that you can expect an increase in work hours of 20% with
with a corresponding 15% increase to your paychecks. Officers who terms or whose teams exceed the new quotas will receive a bonus. I cannot say what the bonus is, but I can let you know that the bonus will include ice cream. Likewise, you will be opening up several previously restricted tunnels to mining operations. The Maripony Mining Company assures you that the tunnels meet and exceed our minimum safety standards. Third order of business. There have been increased reports of trespassing by relocated diamond dogs. Now I don't know if this is a tutorial pack mind thing or if they're just stupid, but if you find a diamond dog on Maripony property, you are instructed to do to instruct the dog to leave. If the diamond dog refuses, use of sonic deterrence are permitted. Ask your team officers for the nearest line to D4, diamond dog turn device, whistles. Now, with convenient neck wrapping loops. Fourth order of business. Thanks to Brickbane, we have had to reset our Days Without Sears Injury Board back to zero. Thankfully, Brickbane will recover the use of most of her limbs. Remember, D4 neck wrappings loops should be kept a short distance so that your whistle cannot dangle into moving machinery. Keep up all the good work, every pony. I turned off the ear bloom. We had reached the stairwell, and my EFS had lit up with more hostiles. Two hellhounds lurked visibly at the bottom of the stairs. They were wearing makeshift armor, and one of them carried a magical energy minigun. There were more around the corner. One of them started sniffing. I, mentioned the, I motioned the others back, and looked to Zenith. In theory, the potion she had brewed was altering our scent, making us smell like mold and bloat sprites. Still, going down to street level was out unless Zenith thought now was the time to go on the offensive. The zebra took her, shook her head. She slipped forward and started up the stairs towards the roof. If I remember correctly, this would put us across the street from the hospital. I didn't think even Calamity could clear Old Old Ney's main street without just a hop, skip, and jump. What am I looking at? It was not the first time those words had come out of my mouth. A late evening wind moaned through Old Olne, pulling our manes and tails. A yard from my hooves was the lumpy puddle of sludge, which had once been the Hellhound sniper positioned at the rooftop of the Maripony Mining Administration Building. Clemente had fired on him the moment we burst into the roof, liquefying the creature before it could attack or howl. A strange antenna sat in the center of the sagging rooftop, humming softly surrounded by magical gemstones that radiated a soft blue light. Around the antenna were several t uh, tables, one of which was still intact and held a glowing terminal that faced away from the others. The others had been clawed to shreds. Strange silvery boxes sat nearby, all but one of them similarly shredded. Helen claws marked sliced into the barricades that ringed the roof. There were several dead ponies up here, all of them pegasi, wearing the same black carapace armor. On click scouting party? I asked Calamity. Our pegasus walked amongst the corpses. They were old, and just dried and rotting flesh, hanging from the bone. No, he said, looking up. This was a science team. Calamity trotted round to the other side of the terminal. I have no idea what they could be doing in Old Olney, or down here at all, for that matter. His voice was grim. But I aim to find out. I recalled what Homage had told me the night she found out the weapon from, from the stars. Joe Blue had suspected it was part of a Grand Pegasus Enclave experiment. Perhaps she had not been so wrong after all. Maybe I should try hacking in? I blurted out, wanting to see what secrets the terminal held. Clemente's armor head looked up, and he lifted his armor's visor. He chuckled. Be my guest, he said, stepping away and welcoming me to the terminal with a swing of his scorpion-like tail. 
but I don't think y'all be able to hack this one. Oh, come on, Calamity. I laughed good-naturedly. I haven't met a terminal that I can't hack yet. I puffed myself up, taking that as a challenge. Y'all ain't never met an Enclave terminal. I stuck on my tongue as I trotted over. Technology all the same. This is me, remember? The little mare with a pit buck on her flank. Let me at it. I stopped as I caught sight of the terminal's interface. It was made of a strange white substance that I couldn't identify. I reached out to touch it, and my hoof went right through it, like there was nothing there. It was made of... clouds? What the fuck? Clemity laughed. I looked around. The Enclave supply boxes all had locks that were made of the same material, either white or a light shade of pink. I looked to him, demanding an explanation as the pony in my head ranted that this was not how things should be. Well, what'd y'all expect Pegasi built stuff out of? There were whole cities up there, built almost entirely out of clouds. I could feel him grinning behind that damn helmet. What, did you believe only unicorn ponies had any magic of their own? I stopped, frustrated. The very idea of terminals and locks that I couldn't get into because they were made of clouds was just... Just wrong and unfair. The words of the goddess floated back to me, with controls which can only be operated by a pegasus. Fuck. The Ministry of Awesome had built key control systems out of fucking clouds. Any pony other than a pegasus who attempted to operate the controls would find themselves clutching slightly damp air. A thought occurred to me. Is there anyone other than a Pegasus who can operate a system with a cloud interface? Nope, Clamity said proudly, then swiftly took it back. Oh, yep, Griffin's can. So, that's how Red Eye was planning to get past that obstacle. And I knew how he was trying to get past the second. We were on the clock again. I sighed, tossing up my hooves in exasperation, and trotted back to the others letting Calamity work on hacking the terminal. Instead, I moved to the edge of the building, I floated on my binoculars, and looked across the street at the hospital. It looked shaken. There were massive cracks running off the walls, and one corner had collapsed. A sign, a yellow cross with a pink butterfly in the center, had started to pull free from the wall two stories up. The upper bolts had torn away from the wall, and the whole sign hung precariously over the street below. One of the windows were shattered, and the winds of old Olney whipped at stained hospital curtains. Even still, it was one of the most intact buildings in old Olney, and it was our best hope for the medical supplies we needed to fix Calamity's wing. I looked across through the rooftop. I could see that the Earth Pony flying contraption clearly, with its candy colored paint job, lit up the setting sun. The name Griffin Chaser 2, emblazoned on the side. It looked in sore disrepair, but I trusted Calamity's expertise. I looked down to the roof, to the main road of Old Olney, a main street, with a set of train tracks running down the center. Hellhounds scampered about, moving from one building to another in packs, hunting us. And night was falling. I was staring at the spikes that adorned a top of a wrought iron gate. They were ugly things, painful looking. I nodded my horn towards one of them. The metal glowed with beautiful blue magic, reshaping itself instantly into a happy, prancing mare. I sent up a prayer of thanks to Celestia and Luna. I was a unicorn mare. It felt good and right. Even better, I was in sunlight. Perhaps the brightest, cleanest sunlight yet. The air was dusty, but clean, reminding me yet again of how odd the air in the real world was. I turned my eyes to the next one, and wove a magical spell over it. This one became a prancing unicorn stallion. I was struck by how much it resembled Prince Blueblood, almost in perfect likeness. The next spike glowed, and transformed into a unicorn mare, head bent as if she was in mid-charge. Her horn aimed dangerously close to Prince Blueblood's 
Behave yourself, Rarity. I heard myself whisper in Rarity's lovely voice. The blue glow of magic surrounded the two figures, again, and they were transformed into entirely different, happy, and generic pegasi. I felt a strange thrill as I realized who I was, followed by a flash of guilt. That old spell, huh? came a voice from directly behind me. I turned, the blue pegasus with the shockingly rainbow-colored mane moving into view. It's not polite to sneak up on ponies, Rainbow Dash. I wasn't sneaking, the Pegasus said defensively. I was just flying. It's not my fault flying is quiet. Rainbow Dash was wearing the purple and black uniform I had seen her before. So, what have they got you doing all the way out in this dustbin for? Rarity looked around, and I was treated to the sight of old Olney. Intact, and well maintained, and bustling with ponies. I was able to see the shops and homes that at once I only known as ruins. And yet, as glorious as the looked in the past was, I could clearly not see old Olne in its heyday. Most of the shops were boarded up. There was a sense of disuse hanging over much of the town, and the bulk of ponies were clearly either military or associated with the Ministry of Arcane Sciences. Apparently, Rory said ruefully. They're having trouble with the diamond dogs again. Fluttershy has tried to talk to them, but it didn't work. So some ponies thought they might pay more attention if I were to talk to them. Gee, Rainbow Dash snickered. I wonder why. Why indeed? Did Fluttershy try to tell them that this wasn't their home anymore? Rainbow Dash asked, hovering in the air in front of me. Or, you know, that it's dangerous? Of course she did, Rarity said. Fluttershy even tried to compromise. Oh, brother. Rainbow Dash face hoofed. But that was when they discovered that Twilight's magical... My host searched for the right... For the best words. Byproducts, shall we say. I've started eating through the barrels. Sunny lost a pony trying to move them when several tore open, like they were made of nothing but... Uh, covering paint. I watched us look Rainbow Dash up and down. You know, I still can't believe you're wearing that. Hey, we're Luna's elite aerial force. What else are we going to call ourselves? How about anything other than the Shadow Bolts? Rarity suggested primly. The way I see it, why not play into the Zebra's crazy Nightmare Moon phobia? The original Shadow Bolts were all just Nightmare Moon, right? Rainbow Dash grinned conspiracy. Wait. Why not use that to our advantage? Every zebra who sees us coming and flees the battlefield is one less zebra we have to kill, or who might kill one of us. Still, I can never get used to seeing you look like that. Actually, Rainbow Dash put a hoof behind her head, brushing her mane. I had an idea about that. Do you think your old dressmaking skills are up to work with the armor? The Pegasus ribbed. Rainbow Dash, you wound me! Oh! Came a shout from somewhere on my host's left. A moment later, a dusty pony in a military uniform got up to a stop and offered a salute to Rainbow Dash. Rarity stepped back. At ease, uh, Dash looked at the pony's uniform. Tank Commander? Torchwood, ma'am. Big fan. Followed your career ever since the Wonderbolts. Rainbow Dash's face brightened. Oh, really? Did you see me at Gallops last year? My host shook her head. I see you're going to be busy for a while, Dash, so I'll catch up with you later, she said graciously. Then, though it was the Pegasus who'd sought her out, do you think you'll be free by dinner? Rainbow Dash turned back. Oh, yeah, no problem. I just want to throw some ideas past you. I could feel Rarity smiling. Also, Rainbow Dash added, swooping close and whispering, I heard rumor that you're working on a new spell with the Ministry of Peace. Something about keeping a pony alive and awake indefinitely? Suspend so that animation, yes. Although, it's not very... It's a very poor description of it, Rarity replied, nodding. And I'm working on it for them, not with them. Part of a 
private line of research that has finally borne some fruits, but it still needs some fine tuning. Dash grinned. Great, because that sounds just like what I've been looking for. Rarity raised an eyebrow. Dare I ask? Oh, just part of the single Pegasus project. I could feel Rarity frown. You mean that thing that has you putting up all those dreadful eyesores all over lovely Equestria? She snorted. They'll look better once they're done, I promise. Abloom said they're elegant. You like elegant, right? Indeed I do, but I'll wait till I've seen them. Rainbow Dash's muzzle broke into a big grin. Just wait till you see the main hub. Actually, you can glimpse its construction when you stand on the roof of the hospital. Just face towards the water tower and look up about a hundred miles, up and out. Rainbow Dash paused. Uh, you might need binoculars. Or a telescope, Rarity snorted. Heh, <laughs> yeah, so anyway, it's not named yet. They couldn't let me name it what I wanted to. Even though it's my damn project and my ministry. So, you wanted to name it Rainbow Dash's Mega Cool Center of Awesomeness, didn't you? Rarity asked. Ripping back. No. Rainbow Dash hovering indignantly. Then admitted, not exactly. Rarity laughed a charming and happy tone. Go tend to your fan, Dash. I'll meet with you later. Rainbow Dash grinned, waved, and swooped back to the tank commander Torchwood. In seconds, they were deep into gushing over the aerial acrobatics of Rainbow Dash, a Pegasus who could apparently do sonic rain booms in her sleep. Rarity turned and trotted away, humming a joyful tune. What did you do? Zenith was demanding of Calamity as it came out of the memory orb. The Pegasus cantered nervously. I don't know, we just started doing that. Mayors perked, picking up a high wine coming from the antenna array. I looked to Calamity, who was staring at the terminal, as if it had betrayed him. With a sinking feeling, I asked, did you trigger a lockdown? Clement shook his head. Nah, I got him just fine. Weren't that hard. He looked up at me, his eyes wide, inside the bug eye like nightmare helmet. And? What is this place? What is it you thought? Clemity swallowed. It's an Enclave experiment, all right. Under orders of Harbringer, one of the Enclave's hot council. They are playing with magical laced sonics, hoping to control the hellhounds. They were trying to make these creatures to slaves, Zenith said in a low voice. I looked around, drinking in the sight of the rooftop with new eyes. I'm guessing it didn't work. What do you think the chances are that we're really lucky and Calamity just triggered the leave us alone signal? Val Remedy asked quibbled grimly, trying to the roof's edge and looking down at the street. She immediately backed up, eyes wide and frightened, her face growing paler under her charcoal coat. I dared a peek. Celestia's solar-heated libido. The street was full of hellhounds. Scores of them. More were moving out of doorways or climbing over buildings. All moving towards us. And they looked pissed. Footnote, maximum level.